In this tutorial, we're going to look at one of the important parts of a FSDL that we haven't paid much attention to yet. It is the types. So I am creating a new class for this tutorial. I don't want to modify the existing product catalog class. So I've created a new class called shop info and it's in the same package org Kaushik Java brains. So this shop info is a new class, which I want to create a web service out of, and I want to have a method here which gives shop related information. So I'm going to have a method called get shop info. It takes in a property and it returns a value of that property. So let's say I have a, a response string here, which by default I initialize with invalid property. And I'm going to check the input property now. And I'm going to check if the input property is shop name. I'm going to give the response as the name of the shop, which is testmart. And the input property is since. I'm going to give the response as since 2012. So basically I'm giving information about the shop depending on what the request is. And then if it's neither, I'm going to return the response, which is invalid property, right? So if somebody wants to know the name of the shop, they just pass in shop name to this method and they get the name of the shop. And if they want to know since when the shop is open, they pass in since as input argument and they get the value. And now this is a simple Pojo. I want to create a web service out of it. So what do I need to do? First, I need to annotate with add web service on top of the class declaration. And then secondly, I declare add web method, even though this is optional, I'm going to do it because I want it to be obvious that this is actually a web method. Okay. And I'm going to fix the imports and we are done. We have created a new web service. Okay. Now let's publish this. And we'll take a look at the visitor. Now the URL for the visitor is shop info service. It's basically the name of the class with the service appended to it. We know that that's the default that, uh, that gets generated and the visitor can be accessed with question mark visitor. Okay. Now if I hit enter, here's the visitor that gets generated. Now I want you to pay attention to this types section over here. So we learned in the previous tutorial that types is basically all the data types that are required for the visitor. Now, what's the data type that we have over here? We are taking an input string and we're returning an input, you know, an output string. Now the types should not really be very complex now, is it? Now, if you look at the types section, there is an element called XSD schema and there is an import that's happening. So it's actually importing a schema from a specific location. It's importing to a namespace. Again, the namespace is being used because we don't have uh, type conflicts, just like we use packages for Java types, we use namespaces for XST types. But then the schema location that it's importing, right? So this is actually a schema that's getting imported. The schema location is this URL over here. You notice there is a separate URL that's getting imported. So actually the type information is not in this file at all. It's in a different file, which is actually getting imported. So let's take a look at this file. What is this file and what does it contain? Now, if I access this in a new page, you notice here, there is a separate schema file that this file is actually getting imported in our visual. Now, what does the schema file contain? Now the schema file contains an element called get shop info and then an element called get shop info response, right? So this is similar to what we've seen earlier. There is an input type and an output type. And then the type itself is defined in more detail over here. Okay. So this is a type declaration. So an excess element is a type declaration and these two type declarations have more details over here. So let's take a look at the input type declaration. So input type is get shop info and the type is TNS get shop info. Now, if you look at the get shop info, you see here, it consists of a sequence type and the sequence says there is one element and the name is arg zero and the type is string. The min occurs is zero. We're going to take a look at min occurs in a minute. And then let's take a look at the output response, right? This is the output type, which is declared over here. 
And then even this contains a sequence with just one element. The name is return and even this is of type string. Okay. Now what does min occurs mean? Min occurs means that this can have zero or more occurrences. Okay. So this means that this could have zero occurrences of the input and zero occurrences of the output. You might be wondering how is it possible because you need to have one input and it definitely returns one string output. So the zero occurrence is to accommodate for nulls, okay? So we can pass in a null as an input, right? This is a string and the string can take a null. So that is why the input occurrence is, I mean, the min occurrence is zero, but we can change this to say, hey, we need at least one string input and this does return at least one string output, okay? So this is, uh, this is what's happening by default, right? So the, the input type and the output type is very simple here. We're just taking in a string and we're returning a string, but notice what Glassfish does. It's generated all this complicated schema and it has created two types, right? One type for input, one type for output, and the type actually just contains one element in as a string, right? Both the input and the output. So this is what gets imported into our whistle. Right, so this is what is defined in our types. And the message, which is actually pointer to types, is actually referring to it. So see get shop info and get shop info response. These are the types that are defined over here. Get shop info and get shop info response, right? It declares the types, first of all, as two elements. It defines those types, and then the message are referring to those types when they are creating the message, right? So this is kind of a, you know, a roundabout way to say that we just need a string as an input and a string as an output. So is there a way to simplify this? Well, there is a way to simplify this and uh, that is by overriding what is happening by default. So I'm gonna override one of the defaults by specifying an annotation called at soap binding. Now the at soap binding annotation takes some parameters. But before we go there, notice the SOAP binding name. Is this same as the binding section here? And if it is, why are we talking about this? Because I, you know, we are talking about types here. Now, why are we configuring the binding section to configure the types? Well, the way it works is this binding section is basically, like I said, a way to configure what goes into the web service and what comes out of the web service, right? So this has impact on the type that we have over here. So let's go with this and we'll see uh, what that impact is in just a minute. So the SOAP binding has a parameter called style and the style takes a value, which if you do control space, you can see it's one of these two values here. One is document and one is RPC. So this is, uh, these are actually two possible ways in which you can configure a web service and uh, document is by default. What we've seen so far in our Vistal is the document style. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna choose the RPC style and I'm gonna say for this web service, I need the SOAP binding to be of style RPC. Now, what does that do? We'll take a look at that. I'm gonna do a publish and uh, I'm gonna call this URL in a different tab so that we can compare what changed. Well, one thing is obvious, we don't have a type section anymore. So notice there was a type section here, right? So this was the import that we saw, but we don't have that anymore. What we have is a message section, which has the types inside it, right? So you have a message called get shop info and a message called get shop info response, right? So two messages like before, but what's happening here is the message has something called as a part inside it. So it's not referring to an external type like before. Here there was an external type defined and the message was pointing to that. Instead, now what's happening is the message has the information inside it, right? So this is, uh, some say it's kind of a bit cleaner because uh, you don't have to go to a different document. You don't have to go to a different XST. There's no external XST here, right? So there's no types section. So you don't have to go to a different XST to get the information. The information is all uh, laid out right here in the message. So there is one input message and one output message. The input message has something called as a part inside it and an output message has an output part inside it. And then the rest of the stuff is 
pretty similar. So you have uh, the message pointing to, you know, the, the input pointing to the message and the output pointing to the message. So one other thing which you would notice here is the binding section has changed like we had expected because we have, after all, configured the SOAP binding for this. Now the SOAP binding says the stylus RPC. Now if you notice here, the style in the SOAP binding was document. Like I said, document is the default. So here the default is style.document, but we have ordered in it and we have set style.rpc. So I hope the document option makes sense. It's uh, it's basically creating a new document. That's why it's called the document, right? So it's creating a new XST document and it is referring to that. But in the RPC way, we just have it in line. And RPC here is kind of, uh, you know, probably a wrong name for this because RPC brings to mind the remote procedure calls, which was, uh, you know, used earlier in Java. This is not really related to that, but it is just the style. So it's the, the way the style is laid out is the RPC style, but still we are using web services. It's not any way related to the RPC technology. Okay, so now we have changed this and you notice that the part here gives information about the input and the output, right? But now the part has something called as a name and the name is arg0 for the input and the name is return for the output. Again, these are something that's, uh, you know, it's happening by default. Now, how do I change this? I don't want my production visual to have something called arg0 anywhere. So the way to change it is by Going over here, so there is uh, the input argument, right? So I want this to have a proper name. So the way I give a proper name in the visual is again by an annotation. And the annotation is web param, right? So I use at web param and uh, let me fix the imports. Now the import is Java, Java web param. Now the web param takes in a parameter and uh, I want to configure the part name. So there's something called as a part name here. So I can give a specific part name that I want the visitor to show. So I can give something called as a uh, lookup input, right? So basically I'm looking, looking up a property. So I want the name to be lookup input. And the same way I can give a name for the response, right? So I can give an annotation call at web, this was a parameter, so it was param. This is a response, so it's result. So I say at web result, and even this, let me import this. Uh, again, from the same package, and again, this has something called as a part name, and I will give a specific name for this, lookup output. And now if I publish, and uh, again, let me take it to a new tab. If I access the Vistal, you can see that the part names have changed. So this is called lookup input, and this is called lookup output. So by chance, if somebody happens to read the Vistal, if a human being happens to read the Vistal, they'll get to know what the, what the parts are. Okay, so this is uh, a couple of ways in which we have uh, configured the SOAP web services. One is we changed the style from document to RPC, and then we changed the names of the input and output parameters. Now the style is one of the ways to configure. So SOAP binding has a few other properties. So if I do a control space, you have something called as a parameter style, and you have something called as a use. So use, actually takes takes two values again. So you have encoded and literal. So literal means the values that you pass and the values that get responded are literally in, you know, in the XML. So encoded makes those values encoded. So encoded is not in use. It's not a part of the standard. Literal is the only one that's part of a standard. So you don't really use the use attribute. All you do is you can configure the style. So you have two options for the style. One is document and one is RPC. Now, since we have two choices, we can choose either document or RPC. The question is, which one do you use when? When do you use a document and when do you use an RPC? And uh, the second question is, if RPC is so easy to read and uh, well laid out, why don't we use this all the time? 
Why is RPC not the default? Why is document the default? The reason document is a default is it does serve a, a, you know, a good purpose. So let me switch this back to document and I'll show you what I mean. So I am changing this to document. Of course, I can just remove this and that should be fine too because document is a default. And uh, I'm going to publish. And we'll take a look at the document that's generated. So this is uh, this was the document uh, visual because I can refresh it again to make sure it's fine. And um, I'm gonna access the XST. Now, if you notice the XST here, it's not just listing the two strings, right? It's not just saying input is a string and output is a string. There's also a whole lot of uh, other details that's here. So it's saying it's a complex type and it has one string in a sequence. And this is also a complex type which has one string in a sequence. So what extra does this bring to the table? So one extra thing that it brings to the table is you can actually validate it, right? The frameworks can actually validate if whatever input is going in is fine. So it makes sure that the min occurs is zero. You can change it to one. Let's say you want to mandatorily have a string, then you can actually set it to one. And if you have multiple different values, if it's a complex object, you can define what the schema is going to be. So essentially the advantage of having a schema is that you can actually validate the schema, but you, you lose that advantage when you are using RPC. So you're just saying this is a string. So if it's uh, if it's just one string, in our, like in our example, just taking in one string and you're returning one string, we can probably live with RPC, but if it's something more complex, it's actually recommended to use the document style because that gives us a separate XST document which can be validated. And uh, your SOAP request and SOAP response will be validated against this schema. So that's uh, better in a way. So that would be one thing to look at when you want to choose between a document or an RPC style. But uh, that would also explain why document is a default because you want the validation feature if you can have it. Okay, so we looked at input types specifically in this tutorial. We looked at ways to configure the names and we looked at ways to configure the style of the binding which affects the input types. In the next tutorial, we're gonna look at a few more customization options for this web service. Thanks for watching.